you're spiritually dead. Amen. Don't get mad. Don't, don't feel like you're getting beat up. Amen. There are so many men and women in the house of God today, so many churches that are spiritually dead, so many preachers that are spiritually dead, preaching a dead sermon to dead people and they don't know it. I was talking to somebody yesterday He was talking to me, he was asking me some questions about the ministries and I was telling him, I'll tell you why there's no freedom in the churches. I'll tell you why there's no deliverance in the churches. I'll tell you why there's no hope in the churches because they're living on yesterday's dreams. They're living on yesterday's anointing. They're talking about what happened 10, 20, 30 years ago. God is a right now God. God is doing something right now and you don't know what God's doing if you're stuck in the past. Come on, somebody say amen. Paul said, I left everything behind. That's, that's, not, that's just not the bad. That's the good, the bad, and the ugly. He left it behind because God's got something new in the future. Amen. And we can't see it because we're stuck past there. Yes. Amen. I went on to tell him, I said, I said there's no freedom preaching to the pulpits because the preachers today are preaching for gain. They're preaching because, of a, because it's a job. They're preaching because it's, it, it, it gives them security in their future. And they're not preaching under the anointing. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. When you preach under the anointed, you offend people, you get people mad at you, people talk about you, people leave you, people abandon you. They did Jesus and they will do you. If, if everybody around you is loving you, there's something wrong with your walk. Come on, somebody say amen. Everybody pat me on the back. Ooh, pastor, you the best things in cream cheese. I'm worried. I am seriously worried, man. I, like, I, I don't love it, but I like it when people are opposing me because I know I'm doing the right thing. Amen. Come on, somebody say amen. Turn your Bible to the book of Amos and hold yourselves there. I believe with every fiber of my being that God is alive, he's trustworthy, he leads us, he guides us, he provides us, he provides for us. And that he wants to make himself known unto us, his plans and his purposes. But how many men and women of God are in the dark? Have no clue what God is doing. Come on, somebody say amen or ouch. He makes himself known to us in every aspect of our life. Not just the little things, not just the big things, but in every aspect of his life, he wants to make himself known to us. But there's so many believers who don't know the will of God, they don't know the plan of God, they don't know God, they barely know how to spell God. And they're the ones that are trying, these are the ones that are supposed to be representing the kingdom. These are the ones that are supposed to be representing joy. These are the ones that are supposed to be representing healing, representing deliverance. And, you know, Jesus said it best, best of the Pharisees and Sadducees. He says, you cross the ocean twice over to make somebody a proselyte. And then you make them twice full of the devil that you already are. We're doing that in our churches today. We'll go everywhere and anywhere to get people delivered, to so-called delivered. Go on everywhere and ever to spread this message and bring them in the church. And we'll make them prejudiced. We'll make them judgmental. We'll make them critical. We'll make them sanctimonious. We'll make them self-righteous. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. And they're twice bound as they ever were before talking about, well, where is God? I'm going to say something. I, I, I can't serve a God that doesn't make himself known to me. I can't serve a God that doesn't make his plans known to me. I can't say, you see, that was what the enemy did. Yeah. I'm going to tell you that the enemy, the enemy of my soul, the devil, that's where I served him. He said, rip, run, do this and do that, but I ain't going to show you the outcome. It was only when I got in the squad car, only when I got behind bars, that I see what his plan was for me. But God says that he knew what he end from the beginning. God's got a plan for you. He says a, a blessed plan to give you an expected hope in the end. God knows what the end is, and he wants you to know what the end is so you can do it joyfully. But we can't serve him joyfully because we're wandering around the dark wondering where God is. Amen. Come on, somebody say amen. Where's God? I just don't understand God. How are you going to be serving God 5, 10, 15, 20 years and not understand God? That's like being married to somebody for 30 years and you said, I just don't understand you. Right. Right. After six months of marriage, you ought to get some kind of understanding. Matter of fact, let me put it plain. Before you get married, you ought to have some kind of understanding. Don't wait till you get married. Before you get married, you ought to have some kind of understanding to who you're getting married and what you're getting into. And we got people that come to the house of God and they jump in and they don't know anything about God. They know everything about religion. Amen. They know about the prayer meetings. They know about the evangelists. They know about what the tithing. They know about everything that they should be doing, but they don't know the spiritual, spirituality behind it. I'm talking about serving a God with joy. The Bible says that, that God is a spirit, and them that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I'm talking about a God, listen to this, that is outside of our universe. You're not understanding this. This blows my mind. Our universe is so vast that scientists cannot find the end of it. 
Now, God can't create something that's here already. He created the universe, but he had to be out of the universe to create it. So he's beyond our understanding. He's beyond our ability to grasp with this finite mind. And when you think about the greatness of God, it makes you stand in awe of his goodness. That even though he's outside of time, outside of our universe, he reached beyond that to deliver you and I, to call us out of darkness. And you think he's going to do that and keep us in the dark about what he's doing? The Bible says he'll do nothing except he reveal it to the prophets. Some of us ended up in wrong relationships and blamed God. Wrong investments and blamed God. Wrong jobs and blamed God. Wrong churches and blamed God. And God had nothing to do with it. You were walking on your own because if you would have asked God, he would have showed you. You willfully chose not to because what you were doing fulfilled your own pleasure. Now, I know that, ain't, that, 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 that is not, that, let me get it right. That is not what we want to hear because we want to be told everything's okay. God loves you just the way you are. Yeah, he does, but he loves you so much that he made a way for you not to remain that way. God is looking for men and women that are called, you know, I see this all the time, soldiers for Christ. Most people wear that just want to slap them. I'm serious. My flesh wants to slap them because they're nandy, panty, whiny, crying about everything. A soldier don't cry. A soldier don't whine. A soldier does what he's told to do. A soldier does what he's commanded to do. He tells us to go through the fire with joy. He tells us to stand faithfully in spite of everything. He says when we stand, stand therefore. We keep on standing. We keep on standing. We don't whine and cry. Oh my God, the Christian walk is so hard. It's so tough being a Christian. I'm the only Christian on my job. Thank God you're the only Christian on your job. You can let your light shine without some interference or some fruit loop messing it up. I'm always getting categorized by other Christians' behavior. I said, man, don't judge me by them. I have a cousin, you know, he quit talking to me. Amen, because he heard that I, uh, he heard, he heard that I was a tongue talker, speaking tongues. I believe in speaking in tongues. I believe in the baptism of the power of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues and it needs to be manifested in the churches today. That's what's one of the things that's wrong with us. We're, doing, we're taking that power out of the church because it's not acceptable. But anyway, he says, you know, I'm still going to heaven even though I want to speak in tongues. I said, I didn't say you weren't. But somebody told him he wasn't. And because somebody else's foolishness, do you know we couldn't connect? We were never able to connect because he just cut me off. So if you're the only one, thank God you, ain't gotta, you, 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 don't, you don't have to defend yourself against somebody else's foolishness. For many Christians, God is a mystery. Where is he? Why is he doing this? Have you ever asked yourself, why did God allow this to happen? You ain't a servant. <laughs> a servant don't ask. Amen. A servant obeys. Hear me. A good servant obeys. When the master tells you, I want you to go dig a ditch, you don't say, how come? You dig the ditch. And the master called Israel to dig a ditch. They didn't say, how come? They dug ditches. And water filled the ditches. And victory became theirs because they were obedient to digging the ditches. See, we cut off our blessings because we want to know why. That implies a lack of trust in the God that we serve. God, I'm going to obey you, but first you've got to tell me. But he'll tell you anyway if you will obey him. According to the word of God, God is only a mystery when you're spiritually dead. Now, don't get beat up. Don't get mad if you find yourself to be spiritually dead over this last 14 weeks. Just believe God that he'll quicken your mortal body and make you alive to hear him. Do you think that God put us in this world, that the God of this world is Satan? Do you think that God put you here without a leading voice, without protection, without guidance, without giving you the direction that you need? He put us here and he gave us everything that we need to succeed. The Bible says he's given us everything to life and godliness, but we're so spiritually dead we don't see it. We have glorified and we lifted up man over God. We glorified and we lifted up the institution of the church over God. When I say the institution, I'm talking about the buildings. I'm talking about the denominations. My denomination's bigger than yours. That kind of crap. 
God ain't interested in denomination. Considered interested in what you're doing with Jesus, how you're walking with Jesus, how you're standing for Jesus, how you're living for Jesus. Most Christians I know will say, oh, I'll die for Jesus. You're lying. You won't even live for him. He didn't ask you to die for him. He's asking you to live for him. He's only a mystery when you're spiritually dead. Turn your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I did tell you to go to Amos, huh? That's okay. I just want to know if you knew where it was. Amen. If you're spiritually dead, you don't know what God's doing. Let me share something with you. There was a time years ago, I was sitting playing around, fooling around with the piano. I don't play. I was just fooling around with the piano, you know, just being stupid. Somebody had my car, and the Holy Spirit prepared me. Your car got in a wreck. Not your car got in a wreck, but the guy wrecked your car. He prepared me. A few minutes later, the door opened, and the guy opens the door, Pastor, and I go, you wrecked my car. He goes, how'd you know? I said, the Holy Spirit told me. See, the Bible says not to be afraid of sudden fear. You ever get that news out of nowhere that just rocks your world? It ought not rock your world. Listen to me. This is a reality whether you like it or not, whether you accept it or not. So it, you know, if it's not in the Word, it wouldn't be a reality. But it's only a reality to them that can grasp it. You want to be religious and not grasp it? That's your prerogative. But I got a responsibility to tell you. Perfect peace will I give them. Not as the world gives, give I unto you, but I give you a perfect peace. Peace will he give to them whose mind is stayed upon him. So there ought to be some kind of quickening, some kind of awakening, some kind of protection from your almighty father over catastrophes. You abide in the shout of the Almighty. The Bible, Psalms 91 says, nothing will hurt you. Nothing will harm you. God will prepare your heart. Why does he do these things? So that we could reach a lost and dying world who's suffering the same things that are doing it without hope. There's many Christians in church, churches today that are suffering problems that the world is suffering and they still have no hope. They're wishing God would move. They're wishing God would talk to them. They're wishing God would do something. But man, why did my uncle die? Why did my father die? Why did my husband die? Why did my child die? Why did I lose my job? I give my tithes. I go to church. I do all these things. I even lift up my hands and I worship the Lord. But why is this happening? Why isn't God doing something? God is, but you're not listening. You're spiritually dead. And nobody's told you you're spiritually dead because everybody you've been sitting under is spiritually dead. Hallelujah. Uh, hallelujah. It used to frustrate my wife because I'd walk into a room and immediately be quickened under, in the spirit as what was going on in the room. You just think you know everything, don't you? <laughs> no. But I'm God, a God that who does know everything. Listen to this. Let's read. Second Corinthians chapter 4. But even if our gospel, the glad tidings, be hidden, obscured, covered up with a veil that hinders the knowledge of God, it is hidden only to those who are what? Do you know how many Christians are perishing because the, because the knowledge of God is not within them to create life? They're sitting in church and they're perishing. Why are they perishing? They're not becoming aware of the grace and the mercy and the joy of living and serving a, God, a living God. Listen to me. Life is good. Life is full of joy. Life is for the living. And you know how many Christians are going through life as if they're spiritual zombies? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Give my tithes, go witness, go to church, praise the Lord, do it all over again. Where's the life of God in us? Where's the joy of serving God in us? Where's, you know, where, 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 where is the scripture that says, I was glad where they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. How many were truly glad to get up and come to church this morning? How many were excited to come to hear the song service today? How many, how many couldn't wait till the word became out where God could bring revelation to you in something? Oh, we're excited to come to church, see who's here, who's not here, so we can have something to talk about. But are you excited to come experience the presence of God? Who are perishing and obscured only to those who are spiritually dying. You're either spiritually growing or you're spiritually dying. You're not going to remain, you know, you're stagnant, you're dying. And veiled only to those who are lost. Based on what the word of God is saying, he's not revealing to himself to us because we're spiritually dying. Are we hungry and are we thirsting after God? 
Are we desiring to have God speak to our heart? Are we desiring to have God change our lives? Are we desiring God to teach us how to be the men of God in our home, to be the women of God in our, women of God in our home? Are we desiring for God to help me become the father I'm supposed to be, to give an example to my children? Are we content teaching our children what was taught to us as, uh, as children? I don't want to teach my children what was taught to me because what was taught me was wrong. I want to prepare them for life in God, not the world. If I prepare my children for life in God, they can handle the world. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Second Corinthians chapter 2, 13 and 14. Let's read. Yet my spirit could not rest, relax, get relief, because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave from them and I departed from Macedonia. But thanks be unto God, and Christ always leads us Always leads us into triumph as trophies of Christ's victory. This is what the world wants to see you as a trophy. Listen to me. You're not a trophy if you're cleaned up addict or a cleaned up alcoholic or just cleaned up. You're not a trophy. Anybody can clean up. I know lots of people who used to be other things than what they are today. And they decided to turn their life around and get cleaned up but they're not a trophy for God because there's no, clean, no cleansing of their soul. Their character's not much different. See, when God changes your character, you become a trophy of God. When you let go of unforgiveness, when you let go of bitterness, when you let go of strife, and you become a comforter to them that used to do you harm, then you become a trophy for God. You know what God's saying? Look, 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 look what I could do with somebody who's willing to submit and surrender. But we want to sit there, we want to nurse those hurts and think we're a trophy because we come to church and we could sing. You know, there's, not in this church, but there's roaches in some churches. There's ants. You know, I know some of you used to clean the church, you know, it's cracked me up. Pastor, we found a cockroach. It was a potato bug. It was a silver bug. Big difference between a silver bug, potato bug, and a roach. I know. <laughs> we had roaches in our refrigerator. The fragrance of knowledge of God everywhere. Though he spreads us, makes us evident the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere. You as a Christian, you as a believer, ought to, be, ought to bring hope, ought to, be, ought to bring grace wherever you go. Not because of who you are, but because of whose you are. But that's not happening today. Most people don't want nothing to do with Christians. They don't want to hear what we have to say because all we want to say is what we ain't living. We want to quote the word of God to them and tell them what they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing, but we don't want to live it before them. I don't want to tell nobody about God. I want to show them about God. Amen. I want to show them the grace of God. I want to show them the mercy of God. That means you got to stop judging. You got to stop criticizing. You got to stop condemning. And you got to start accepting. Whether you like it or not. So don't beat yourself up if you find yourself to be spiritually dead. Your Bible, the Bible says, you hath he quickened who were dead in your mortal sins. God can quicken us to the life of Christ. God can quicken us to a life of victory. God can quicken us to a spiritual life if we choose it. So you know what a spiritual life is? Nobody? <laughs> Most Christians are spiritually dead. That's why they don't know it. They think a spiritual life is being slain in the spirit. Speaking in tongues. Jumping up and down. Shouting hallelujah. That's not a spiritual life. I could be having a spiritual life mugging, not mugging somebody purposely, but they think I'm mugging them. I'm riding my bike, listening to my blues. You know what a spiritual life is? that I'm at God's beck and call service anytime he needs me right here and now. I don't say, no, 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 Lord, I'm too busy. No, Lord, I ain't got time right now. Are you ready for God's service? Or are you so spiritually dead you can't hear him when he's calling? And he's calling you. He's calling you. There was a time I was so spiritually dead that God called me, told me to pray for this lady that had cancer, that she would be healed. And I ignored it. And I heard her talking to my boss's mother. And she said, I'm going to my treatment. I have cancer. I put my head down. I said, God, I'm sorry. 
See, you are the only conduit God has to bring healing to a sick world. But when we're spiritually dead, we're not hearing it. We're not listening because our plans and our purposes are more important. I was too busy writing up a work order. I was too busy trying to get the job done to hear what God was saying. What are you too busy trying to do to hear what God's saying? You're too busy trying to build your kingdom? Too busy trying to build your family? You're too busy with yourself? I found out one thing. If I'm too busy, for, if I'm too busy to hear God, I'm too busy. I need to slow down so I can hear God. Spiritually dead people don't hear the voice of God. They're always wondering where God is, what God's doing, why is God doing this? I don't care why God's doing it. I just care that I hold on to the end. God, give me the strength, give me the ability to hold on to the end, and in the end, you'll let me know. Amen. Are you happy? Are you content? Are you tired of living from one trial to another 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 trial? Don't get me wrong, even victors have trials. But it's all about the perspective. Amen. This last 10 years, I could tell you, trial after trial after trial after problem after problem after problem I've had. But rather than do that, I focus on the victory after victory after victory after victory after victory I had. Everything that came, there was a victory prayer for me before the trial happened. But when you're spiritually dead, all you see is the negativity. I say, man, when's this going to end? When you die. Because as long as you're alive, you're going to have troubles. So as long as you're going to have troubles, be alert, better learn how to handle those troubles. Because the Bible says, greater is he that you knew than he that's in the world. The ways of God are not mysterious. They're not a mystery. What happened last Sunday was not a mystery. God showed me the prior Sunday before that what was going to happen. They're not a mystery. They're only a mystery to them that are perishing. Now you can turn your Bibles to the book of Amos. Chapter 3, verse 7. They're not mysterious. Many believers are spiritually dead because they've adapted to, erroneously to the idea that the ways of God are mysterious and past finding out. After all, you never know. Sometimes he will, sometimes he won't. Most times he won't. So I'm just going to endure. I thank God for the men of God that were in my life when I first got saved. Because if I was to get saved today by the characterization of some of the men of God that I've come to know over the years, I don't know if I'd got saved. The man of God that led me to the Lord let me know at all times he always had the victory. Let me know at all times not to focus on what's happening around me, but rather focus on the praise that's within me. Let me know at all times that no matter what the circumstances are, God is worthy of my praise. And I learned how to adapt it in my life, and I learned and I realized that that turned every single situation around. But how many of us lose our salvation because circumstances? We lose our joy because of circumstances. Now, don't get me wrong. You're not going to go through a trial and run around like, oh, praise the Lord. You're not going to do that, man. You know, that's why Scripture says weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Nobody has to see your weeping. Nobody has to see your sorrow. Nobody has to see your pain. I'm conscious, very conscious, not to even allow my wife to see my misery, my pain in the ministry. Now, don't get me, there is misery and there is pain in the ministry. You need to learn how to deal, it, deal with it. You need to learn how to suck it up, tighten your belt, and just move on with God. Because that's what ministry is all about. Because you're dealing with problematic people. You're dealing with hurtful people. You're dealing with hurt people. And God anointed you and ordained you to bring them through so you can't take it personal. Amen. So I wasn't going to take it home to her and afflict her with it. I'm not going to allow her to see me being weak in the faith. Not trying to be a superman, just being the man that God called me to be. Raise yourself up, bro. Time to take the pampers off. Put the big boy chonies on. Amen. Say, Lord, I'm standing. And then when you say that, the devil says, oh, yeah, let's see. Amen. And when the stuff comes against you, says, I win, I win, I win, I win, I win. Listen to this. God is not trying to keep you in the dark. And if you've been in the dark, come to the light. Light and dark is a contradiction. God is not trying to keep you in the dark about anything in your life. Charles Caps, 
which was just a dirt farmer, a penniless dirt farmer, became a multimillionaire hearing what God was telling him. Made investments by going into his prayer closet and asking God direction. And God gave him direction. Now God just didn't give him direction so he could get money. He invested into the kingdom. Hmm. Hear what I'm saying. See, some of us were were excluded from the wealth that God promised us because you'll take it upon yourself instead of giving it to God. Now God don't care if you enjoy it. He wants you to be a part of the fruit of your labor, but you take it all. Forget God, shoot. I'm going traveling. Listen to this. Surely the Lord will do nothing what does nothing mean? When your wife asks you, what, when you ask your wife what's for dinner, she says nothing. <laughs> what are you going to get? Nothing. So we understand nothing. God says he will do nothing without revealing his secret to his servants and his prophets. So why, why are you in the dark about what God's doing? You may not totally understand But when you accept it, he gives you the grace to go through it. And when you get the grace to go through it, he reveals his plan to you. You see, I was was perplexed, totally perplexed for a period of time. See, I had an awesome uh, associate pastor. We had marriage counselors. We had had, uh, a a man here that was going to help develop a, uh, uh, a, a summer camp routine for the men. Everything was going, flowing the way that it was supposed to go. And all of a sudden, it fell apart. Those very same people divided the church, took people, took all the, t- t- they, were, they, were, they were privy to the, uh, uh, to the finances and they, and they targeted every one of the tithers. Those of you that are here, you, you resisted a bit against it because you knew. And God, why is this happening? And it happened when we went away to enjoy ourselves. First vacation we had like in 10 years, went to Alaska, come back, guess what, bam. So for the next two years, we stood here and we rejoiced and we shouted the victory. And somewhere in that period of time, God revealed to me why he did what he did. He will do nothing except he reveal it to the prophets. And this is what he spoke to me about. He says, I had to remove them that were religious because they were putting you back in that religious box and I called you to freedom. Amen. See, they wouldn't allow what we have here today to be here today because it was so against everything that they thought was right. So God says, no, I got something special. For, so when God takes something away from you, it may be for your good rather than your wrong. Yeah. But God, I don't understand why you did this. Be faithful and he reveal it to you. I stood here, right here in this spot, and cautioned every church member in here not to say nothing wrong. Don't think evil. Pray. And in the midst of that obedience... God deposited the why. And when he deposited the why, it gave me the grace to go through the rest of it. See, we don't have the grace to go through it because we have not been revealed. The why has not been revealed to us and we're still mourning about the loss. I don't consider what was removed a loss. I consider God pruning the tree so the fruit can grow. Ain't that what he says? He will prune the tree so the fruit can grow? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many are on the verge of being pruned? <laughs> Hallelujah. I'll just tell you what the word says. Amen. See, I don't want to be pruned. Amen. I found myself to be a vessel unfit. I said, God, help me to be fit. Make me a vessel of honor. Don't prune me. Prune him. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Psalms 32. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Let's read. I, the Lord, will instruct you. Come on, either God's a liar or he's not. How many of us are looking for direction? Amen. And we'll ask everybody but God. Amen. Oh, why didn't I think of that? And teach you in the way you should go. Don't raise your hand, but how many believers have been going the wrong way week after week, month after month, year after year? Oh, this is where I should go. You treat me good. I like you. You love me. Oh, it wasn't you. Oh, hey, how you doing? You treat me good. 
Oh, it wasn't you? I've seen more men and women lose their place in God and their anointing over a relationship they thought was God. I have a policy. I will not. I will not. I will not. I'm going to say it again. I will not counsel on matters of the heart. Well, my other pastor, well, he only tells you what you want to hear because if he told you the truth, you wouldn't like him either. When you go for counsel for the matter of the heart, you want to be told what you want to hear. Because, oh, he makes me feel good. She just treats me so wonderful. Yeah, but there's a side of them you don't see that the Spirit of God is showing. You don't know. Come on. Hello? Look, it's been 30 years. It ain't changed. The only thing that changed is the people. God said, I will instruct you. So instead of going, instead of going to a man for answer, why don't you go to God? Because the first thing I'm going to ask you when you come to me, what did God say? How many know that to be a fact? I'm going to ask you, what did God say? If you say, well, God didn't say nothing, I said, what are you here for? I'll just tell you what God said when God tells you what he said. Because all we're supposed to do is affirm what the Holy Spirit already told you, not tell you, and, let, and let, you say, let you put it on us. I, the Lord, will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Does that sound like a God who will keep you in the dark? See, but when we don't know this, we remain in the dark. He says, you shall find me when you search for me with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. So we're as spiritual as we want to be or as non-spiritual as we want to be. Right, right. Well, gee, if I don't know, then I can plead ignorance. <laughs> you ever been to court? I went a couple times. <laughs> so, well, I didn't know. Ignorance is no excuse. But I didn't know. Sentence is still passed down. Even though you didn't know. So you may not know that God wants to reveal himself to you, but sentence is still passed down. What was the sentence? John 10, the thief came to steal, to kill, and destroy. Because you not knowing that God wants to reveal himself to you in every aspect of your life. The enemy comes by and he steals, he kills, and he destroys everything that God has for you. God's got a man for you. I hear some of you saying, when? <laughs> when you get yourself right. God got a woman for you. God got a partner for you. Not partner. But God has a partner for you. Amen. And you don't have to, oh, are you the one? Are you the one? Are you the one? You don't, you don't have to do that every time somebody comes in. God will reveal it. Not to this man. I see the sister one time go to some guy. God told me that you're my man. That guy took off quick. <laughs> no. God will tell you so you can prepare yourself. He ain't tell you so you can make it happen. He'll make it happen. See, but we don't believe that, so, you know, we go ahead and we set ourselves up for failure by making it happen. Because God's keeping us in the dark. So I'm going to put on my clothes that make me fit and look good so I can catch. And then you're crying to God a year later what you caught you didn't like. <laughs> Again, the biggest failure in the churches today are marriages. It's the biggest failure because we've got Christians getting married prematurely. And then when you get married, oh my God, I guess we're stuck, yeah? Amen. You got to work it out. And it's easier to get married right than to have to work it out when you started off wrong. Right, right. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2. Again, I, can't, I cannot emphasize enough that the ways of God are not mysterious. Every time, I, every time something happened in my life that I, uh, I didn't pay attention to God, God was showing me, but oh my God, I had to have it. I wanted it. I didn't want to hear God tell me no. I didn't want to hear God tell me later. I wanted it now. How many spoiled brats we got? <laughs> I want it now. And God's saying, wait, now's not the time. But we don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear that. God will reveal himself to you 
Not after the fact, before the fact. That's what makes God so great, so loving, so kind, so caring. That he will speak to us, he will guide us, he will lead us. Not just, this is not just a new covenant direction. He told Moses that when Moses was going into the wilderness, that an angel will go before you and he will speak in your ear and he will tell you when to go, where to go, how to go, and why to go. This is just God's character. He wants to protect us. He wants to lead us. So when, God's, when something happened to your life and you don't understand and you got lost, you can't say, why this happened, God? You wasn't listening to him. There's an a, a intuition that we have. There was intuition that I had before I was saved. And then, oh my God, it worked good. And whenever I worked against it, it worked bad. Something would tell me not to go somewhere. And when I listened to it, it all worked good. But when I didn't listen to it, I got arrested, I got jacked up, I got hurt, I lost. Now that was the enemy giving me that intuition to keep me. God will give you intuition and he will give you direction to bless you. But we're not listening. And we're not listening because we think we got it together. I've been coming to church five years, man. I haven't said a swear word in two weeks now. I'm doing good. <laughs> Scripture says, he that thinketh he stand, take heed lest he fall. Our reliance has to be consistently upon God and not our own understanding. Man, I, I know how to formulate a, a, a four-point sermon. I know how to put Bible stuff. I, 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 I can do this, that, and the other thing with the Word of God. I could preach circles around you. Yeah, it's nothing but God's grace and mercy in your life that gives you the ability to do that. You do nothing on your own. When we decide to take it upon ourselves, we shut ourselves up from communication with God. The scripture says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saying to the church. Saying, what does saying mean? Consistent. God is always talking to us, but we ain't always listening. Right now in this room, there's UHF waves, there's satellite waves, there's VHF waves, there's AM radio waves, there's FM radio waves, there's series radio waves that are in this room. Going through your body, through your mind, through your ears, you know, through your whole body, filling this entire room, but we're totally ignoring it because we're not tuned into it. But when you get the right components to tune into it, you can hear it. Now, uh, some of you is old enough to remember this. KDIA used to be a hard radio to get, 1260 on the radio dial, AM. And you'd, 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 you'd get 1240, 1250, 1270, and you'd, you'd get, there it is. You had to tune in just right. KDIA was a soul station, man. All right? You had to tune in just right to hear it. And sometimes when your car went the wrong direction, Amen. Cruising down East 14th and you turn left on 98th Avenue. All of a sudden you lost it. Hello? You tune into God, you got to stay on the path that God wants you to have to stay tuned into Him. Because if you go the wrong direction, you lose contact with Him. Dude, I don't understand why God's doing this. What is He doing? What is God doing? I'm trying to understand that. When I hear people say that all the time, wait a minute, God didn't make your husband full of sickness and disease. You fed him all that fat food. <laughs> I don't understand why God's doing this, man. God, he's in the hospital. He's in the hospital because he's full of pork chops, neck bones, beans, tortillas, enchiladas, and all this stuff that he shouldn't have been eating for 20 years. And now you want to blame God. God was trying to tell you a long time ago. Stop. I was 50 years of age before I ate any vegetables. Just didn't like them. And I started eating them because God healed me of hep C. And the first thing God told me, I remember driving out of the driveway. The first thing I did is I called my wife and told her the doctor's report. I said, the doctor can't find a trace of it nowhere. He's upset. So we got to do it again. And I pulled out of the driveway and I hung up the phone and I turned right. And the Holy Spirit says, now that you got your healing, you got to learn how to keep it. Hello? God will direct you. God will keep you. But we're creatures of habit. We want to do what we want to do because we want to do what we want to do. 
That's all there is to it. And the Bible says you're not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Stop doing what you want to do because you want to do it. Because what you wanted to do when you wanted to do it didn't work when you did it. <laughs> That'll make my voice go up like Brother Charlie there. <laughs> Amen. Where are we at? Ephesians 2. God wants to make himself known to you. Listen, God is not playing hide and seek with you. You know, like that Geico commercial. Oh, you almost got it. You almost got it. <laughs> God's not doing that. Listen, God wants to pour you out blessings that you cannot contain. You know, we hear preachers preaching this all the time. Oh, the blessing is going to run you down and take you over when you stop running. But God, so rich is he in his mercy because of and in order to satisfy the great and wonderful and intense love with which he loved us. Listen to this. God is not doing this because you're wonderful. God is not doing this because you're wonderful or you're cute or you give ties or you, you're, you got gifts or you got talent. God did everything he did to satisfy his love for you. Imagine that. God loved me while I was still a sinner, still in rebellion, still in my stubbornness, still in my resistance, to satisfy his love for me. It had nothing to do with me. He said, I love you so much, I got to do this so that I am satisfied. So who am I to rob God and say, I ain't nobody? No, I am somebody in him. Even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses, and made us alive together in fellowship and union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself. Listen. He gave you. I don't know. If this don't get you excited, I don't know what, do, what, do, what will. The very life of Christ lives in you. Amen. The God of this universe dwells within you. And he didn't dwell within you as you go, No. Where's the smile? Where's the joy? Where's the victory? Where's the compassion? Where's the love? Where's the understanding? That's what God is. The Bible says God is love. Why all the judgmentalism? Why all the criticism? Why keeping people out of the church? Why separating people in the church? Because God ain't in you. You have a form of godliness, but you deny the power thereof. If God was in the churches today the way that we says he was, the church doors would not be big enough to bring people in. There would not be enough chairs in here. The walls, we couldn't extend them far enough, but we're also hypocritical and judgmental. Judgmental. <laughs> judgmental. Not understanding, we're not even walking very close to his anointing. He gave us the very life of Christ himself, the same new life with which he quickened him. For it is by grace, his favor and mercy, which you did not deserve, you are saved. Because his life dwells within me, delivered from judgment and made partakers of Christ's salvation. Man, what does it take to get us excited? What does it take to make, wake us up and say, wow? I mean, I, 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 I was, you know, went to the gym this morning and, and I'm thinking about the Lord and I'm just, I want to shout. But, you know, the only time I sh really shout is here. I'm, re I'm very conservative. I don't like attraction. I don't like attention on me. I'm quiet, right? You see me in a crowd of people. I'm usually the quiet one, talking to one or two people in the corner and then just mingling. But I wanted to shout and had to contain myself. Because I was thinking about his goodness. I was thinking about his mercy. And it's hard to contain when you realize that he did this all to satisfy himself and not you. I can't fathom, God, how you could love me so much that you would set your holiness aside to reach out and touch me in spite of all my perfections, in spite of my shaking my fist at you, in, in spite of me saying, I want nothing to do with you, you had to satisfy your love for me and draw me in anyway. And not only do you do that, but you show me your glorious ways. If you do not understand where God is taking you, again, I want to tell you, you are spiritually dead. And I'm not telling you that, the Bible is telling you that. Isaiah chapter 55, and this is the scripture that we use to prove to people that God's ways are past understanding. Amen. We can never understand God's ways. No, not with your finite mind. You can't understand God. 
But the scripture we just read said that where is, where is Christ's spirit now? It's in us. So if Christ's spirit is in us, it gives us the ability to understand the voice and the direction and the guidance of God. But with our natural mind that is hostile against God, we cannot understand God. But how many believers are accepted that fact that you can never understand God because his ways are past understanding? We've accepted that fact. So especially when we get into a place we just don't grasp, we got no answer for, oh well, you know, things we've got to pass understanding. No, it's time for me to evaluate my circumstances, evaluate my situation, and to see what's going on. Is, did I bring this upon myself, or is this just something that happened? If I brought it upon myself, let me cleanse my ways, let me consider my actions, let me consider my behavior and get back where I belong. And if this is something that just happened, like the Spirit led Christ into the wilderness, and the Spirit's leading me, then maybe I just need to follow and shut up. Maybe I just need to praise him all, all through this and see what happens. Let's read Isaiah chapter 55. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Well, that's very clear and understanding right there. That tells us that we can never understand God. But they neglect to put it together for us in the way that we can totally grasp it spiritually. For as the heavens are higher than earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. But the Bible tells us in the New Testament, New Testament believers, let the mind of Christ dwell in you richly. Do you think that God's going to keep his son in the dark? He didn't keep his son in the dark. Even when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he knew what was waiting for him at the cross of Calvary. And he interceded and he tried to pray. And he said, God, he says, if it's possible for your plan to be fulfilled in any other way, let it be fulfilled. But if not, give me the strength to endure this. He did not keep Christ in the dark. Neither is he going to keep Christ in you in the dark. Do you know why he doesn't keep you in the dark? Because we're living in a world that is full of darkness. And he sent you out as what? Lights. And it's not, your light is not just the gospel. Your light is the hope of glory that lies within you. You know what that hope of glory is? The hope of glory is healing. The hope of glory is hope. The hope of glory is sanctification and cleansing, and the whole world needs it. And if we walk out in that world, we become friends with people that don't know God. We can change their world. Yesterday, we were blessed. Treasure Out of Darkness was invited to Vallejo. Brother Ray uh, did a um, community event out there in his neighborhood. Now, he's been coming to here, him and his wife have been coming here, I won't even guess how many years, because I'll, I'll mess it up. But they've been coming here long enough to be doctrinated in the Word. Amen. And in the Spirit, more importantly. And he took this gospel, and he went to his neighborhood, and he single-handedly changed his neighborhood. Single-handedly reached out to every one of his neighbors in the neighborhood single-handedly brought in the grace and the mercy of God in his neighborhood, turned the culture of his neighborhood around because of the message that he was hearing here. Here's somebody says, you know what? God be my guide. God be my lead. So he took a step of faith and he reached out and allowed God to use him. Realized, you know what? I don't want just this hope in here. I got to take it out there. We're, 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 we're called to travel through a dark and dangerous world, but we're not called to travel the dark and dangerous world alone. He said, I will be with you always, even to the very end of time. His ways are past understanding to the natural man. But saints, you are not natural men. Paul put it like this. He said, I marvel that you're acting like mere humans. I marvel that Christians are acting like mere humans, not understanding the things of God. Why, uh, pacified ourselves by saying, well, the ways of God are past understanding. No, they're not. If you don't understand, get down on your knees. You might have to fast, oh my God. You might have to give up a meal. Let me share something with you. You are not going to die if you give up a meal. Some of us look like we could give up a bunch of meals. Go to John chapter 16, myself included. Do I want to? No. I don't want to give up a meal. I love my food. Therefore, I'm going to develop an ear to hear God so I don't have to give up a meal. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Listen to this. You see, as believers, we believe that the Holy Spirit is here to make us feel good. 
The Holy Spirit is here to give us goosebumps. The Holy Spirit is here so we get slain in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here so we can, we can I'm trying to talk over that, but it's not working. <laughs> Amen. The, the, the Holy Spirit is here to, to uh, uh, give us everything that makes us feel good. That's not what the Holy Spirit's here for, saints. That is not what the Holy Spirit's here for. The Holy Spirit is here to guide you, guide you, guide you. That means you shouldn't be in darkness. That means you shouldn't be in pain. See, we quit seeking him. We quit searching for him. We quit desiring him. Yeah. And we have settled in, in, into conformity. We've settled into religious attitudes because I know how to do things. It's a very dangerous thing when you know how to put a message together because it's so easy to rely on your ability to do it. Right. Right. And you need to consistently tell yourself, it's not by might nor by power, but by his spirit. God, you do this. God, you do this. Over the years, I, myself, I, I, I have disciplined myself to consistently and always put myself aside in that prayer closet and that study time for the Holy Spirit to speak through me. But there was times where I wanted to do it myself because I just didn't want to take that time. Because sometimes we get selfish. And when you don't hear God, you try to do it, all of a sudden it don't work right. Aren't you getting tired of it not working right? Listen to me. I believe the Bible through and through. I believe it's real. I believe it's powerful. I believe that it's immutable word of God. The Bible says, Psalms 1, whatsoever righteous man touches shall prosper. I believe that. Why aren't the works of our hands prospering? God wants to show the whole world his goodness. But it's not happening because we're incorporating uh, uh, humanistic teachings. We're incorporating our own ideologies and everything else into our faith rather than God. When you try to, you know, at least when I do, when I talk to people about God, I say, well, it's God, 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 it's God, 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 God. It's always God with you, brother. You know, you just, you got too much of God in you. How can you have too much of God in you? Ask somebody tell me that one time. You got too much of God in you. Well, I take that as a compliment today. You know? See, we want enough of God so that we feel good, but not enough God to change our character. I want enough of God that when I feel a curse word forming in my mouth, that it don't taste good. I want enough of God in my enough of God in me so that when I want to tell somebody, shut up. My daughter Nyla was raised in the house where shut up was not allowed. Amen. We, we, we're not allowed to say shut up. And I remember the first time I said it, said it to Gloria. Said it in a nice way, but I still said it. <laughs> Just shut up. I never figured she'd go, ooh, you said a bad word. I said, shut Oh, yeah. <laughs> it got by the Holy Spirit because it wasn't listening. How many follow what I'm talking about? How many stuff coming out of your mouth gate that got by the Holy Spirit because you weren't listening that you need to change that? And we pacify ourselves. Well, you know, at least I'm not like I used to be. So what? At least you're not like you used to be. What's that mean? You're still mad nasty. John 16, 13. This is the purpose of the Holy Spirit that he may reveal to you what the Father's doing. But how many of us have no relationship with the Holy Spirit? <coughs> what I mean by that, listen to this. Paul said, I pray in tongues more than you are. Sing in tongues and I'll, and I'll pray in tongues. The Bible tells us that we edify ourselves by speaking in tongues. Get revelation of God by speaking in tongues. I don't care what your denomination, I don't care what you think about it. Bible says you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Jesus told the disciples, he says, go tarry in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And it says that it came upon them with cloven tongues of fire and baptized every one of them with Holy Ghost and fire. The church is in dire need of its men and women getting baptized with the Holy Ghost of fire. Until you get that Holy Ghost fire baptism, you're always going to be leaning on psychology and your own understanding and try to get the work of God done. But when you get the work of God done with the Holy Ghost fire baptism, you can plow through everything and anything and nothing will move you because you learn how to depend upon an almighty God. But when he, the spirit of truth, the truth-giving spirit comes, he will, listen to this, he's talking to the church. Preachers for generations have been telling us, oh, the Holy Spirit comes to condemn you of your sin. No, the Holy Spirit comes to condemn the world of its sin. My regenerated spirit condemns me of my sin. 
because I've been quickened. I don't need the Holy Spirit to tell me that anymore. I need my Holy, my Spirit will condemn me of my unrighteousness because I've been quickened to the life of God. The Holy Spirit will condemn the world of their sin because they don't know. The Holy Spirit condemned me of my sin when I walked into the church for the first time. Ever from that moment on, my own spirit condemned me of my unrighteousness because I was in tune with God. But when he, the spirit of truth, the, giving, the truth giving spirit comes, he will guide you into, into what? All the truth. The whole full truth. For he will not speak his own message on his own authority, but he will tell you what he hear, whatever he hears from who? What's he going to tell you? Whatever he hears from the Father. So the Father's telling the Spirit, tell them Pancho is not the one. <laughs> and we say, oh, but I love Pancho. Pancho takes me out for dinner and he tells me how beautiful I am, but the Holy Spirit says, no, Pancho's not the one. Leroy is the one. <laughs> he will give the message that has been given to him. God is not trying to give, put you in the dark. And he will announce and declare to you the things that are to come. The Holy Spirit will tell you things that are going to happen tomorrow. Next week, next month, next year. Things to come. You're not hearing me. This is a God that we serve that we've not allowed to minister to our spirits in because we're too busy trying to formulate our own Christianity, our own version of it. Here's what he says, wait upon the Lord. Wait. Well, what if he don't tell me nothing? Keep waiting. Do you know, I was uh, uh, seeking the Lord in a fast one time. And I was like 21 days, 20 days into my fast. And this is what stops us from finding God. Our desires to fulfill our own pleasure. Amen. And I cut myself short of finding the direction of God in this because I'm thinking, gee, what if I die and I never eat an apple pie? I don't get to eat Super chunk peanut butter sandwich. So I sold out for some stupid piece of food that satisfied me for the moment. But the Holy Spirit was trying to lead me into some deep truths that I desperately needed and wanted. I sold out for some fruit, so food. Eve sold out for fruit from the tree. What are you selling out for? A cheap date? Huh? A job that you want, that you like, that God never called you to? What are you selling out to? And then blaming God. But I don't hear you, God. Because you're selling out. You were bought with a price. It says glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. He wants to direct you. He wants to lead you. He wants to guide you. He will not leave you in the dark. He will show you his plan. Go to Luke chapter 11. This will be our last scripture. Hallelujah. If you're one of those ones that have been walking around and, and, and proclaiming the ways of God are mysterious and past finding out, please today stop. I've shown you that he wants to reveal himself to us. But there's things in our life that stop him called self-will. We need to get rid of that so he can make himself known to us. God wants to show you and I off to this whole world and show the world what he can do with somebody who's willing. God was sent. He sent his son to the world amongst a bunch of rejects. This boggles my mind. In the lineage of Christ is a prostitute. Amen. He sent his son, to Jerusalem, which was a ghetto. The Bible says that God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He chose the castaways, the rejects of society, so he could fill them with his goodness and show off what his glory can do to people that are listening. And you know what we do? We come into church. 
We don't allow transformation to take place. We allow our fears and insecurities to be fed and we feed them and we act on them and then we reject the word rather than allowing the word of God to build us up and to establish us. Amen, amen, amen. Good stuff, Pastor Mike, even though I don't want to hear it. The good stuff, man. <laughs> Luke chapter 11. Let's read. If you then, evil as you are, <laughs> I'm not telling you that. God's saying that. God's saying you are evil as can be. And in your evilness, you now have to give good gifts to your children. Not a one of you are going to just smack your kid upside the head just because you feel like smacking them. Amen. They ask you for, 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 for something at the store. You're not going to go to the store and, 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 and you know, they, they, they want a, 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 you know, I don't know, video game and you go home, go home and, you know, get them a cupcake. You're not going to give them the cupcake. You're going to get them the video game they want because you want to be a good parent. Listen to what he says. How much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask and continue to ask him. Listen to this. That sounds like a strange answer. He's talking about things and he jumps into a person. God's not interested in you getting things. Amen. God, I need a house. I need a husband. I need a wife. I'm tired of being alone. Who told you you was alone? Nothing wrong with being alone. The Apostle Paul said, I wish everybody could be like me. <laughs> You'd be mindful of the things of God. Amen. Marry a husband or wife, man, all of a sudden you become their slave. <laughs> Not all the time, but, you know, I mean, sometimes you get the wrong one. You know what I mean? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Not all the time. But it goes from talking about things. God, I need a car. I need this. I need that. And our whole life is based on things right? Buy more things, get more things, I'm more complete, I'm more full. I hate things because it just fills your life up and you got to take care of it and it just, but I mean, it's okay, but you know, I mean, the blessings of the Lord, so they're good, but sometimes you get overwhelmed with those blessings, but God said, I'm going to give you something more than things, and he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit's saying right now. He said, I'm going to give you something more. You being evil know how to get good gifts to your children. I'm not evil and I give better than gifts. I give to you the gift giver. Listen to this. The Bible says by him, everything that's been made has been made. The Holy Spirit is the gift giver. God says, I'm not going to give you a car. I'm not going to give you a boat. I'm not going to give you the money you need. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit and he will guide you into the things that you need through life. Do you hear this? The Holy Spirit will guide you. So it's imperative for us to learn how to have a hearing ear to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying because God's not interested in giving you things. He's interested in giving you the person of the Holy Spirit who will take you to the things that you need because you've filled your righteousness with Him. Oh, come on. You should have praised the Lord right then and there. Should have gave the Lord a praise right then and there. How much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him and continue to ask Him? I quit a long time ago asking God for things. I simply don't do it. Because the Bible tells me he knows what I have need of before I ask. And while I'm asking, he'll answer. I just pray, God, give me the ability to understand where the Holy Spirit's taking me so I can see it. All around us every day, miracles are being created and we don't see it. We don't see it because we, we miss the biggest miracle of all. We want to see, how many want to see a miracle? Amen. Amen. I'm going to show you a miracle right now. I'm going to show you a miracle when you go home. Because I, I, I don't have it to show you right now. I mean, I have it to show you, but I don't have the tool to show you. I'm going to show you after church. Go in the bathroom. Okay, wait a minute. Look in the mirror. What do you see looking back at you? I see a miracle looking back at me. That miracle was possible because of a relationship with the Holy Spirit. He led me to the truth that gave me the life of God in Christ Jesus. You are a miracle. 
Don't allow anybody to sell you short of that. You are a miracle that is waiting to walk in the anointing that God designed for you to walk in. God is not trying to keep you in the dark about that. He's trying to enlighten you so that you could be glorified in Him. So when somebody says, oh, thank you. Oh, no, it wasn't me. It was, it was God. Thank you. No, God used you. God don't care if you ride the train with him, but just don't be the driver of the train. God can't do it without your mouth. God can't do it without your hands. God can't do it without your feet. You are the conduit which the Holy Spirit wants to make miracles happen. But you've got to understand that you are a miracle so the miracles can flow through you. Listen, you'd have been dead if it was up to the devil. And some of you know it. Some of you know it. You know it beyond the shadow of a doubt. And instead of giving back to the kingdom, you're sitting on it wondering, where is God? He's here all the time. Just accept his goodness. Did you learn something this morning? Come on, give the Lord a praise. Amen, amen, amen.